This is Hidden Killers Week in Review. A look back at the most prolific stories of the week. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. We're talking again with author and reporter Leah Satilli about Chad and Lori Daybell. She's author of the book, When the Moon Turns to Blood. When you look at the egging each other on, what I think a lot of us have been watching and wondering and we just saw it kind of come to fruition here just a couple of weeks ago is, is somebody going to break here? Is somebody going to flip, if you will? Mm-hmm. And I think flip's a weird way of describing it in this case, because you think of flipping of like, oh, someone's consciously knows that this is wrong and they're going to flip on the other person. For a while, I, I don't think either of them seemed to realize everything that they were doing was wrong. Lori, I still, I question if she does to this day, judging from what her speech was at the the sentencing you know, the kids have great new jobs at Home Depot in heaven or whatever it was that they're working at this week. Tasty freeze, maybe. But Chad, you know, we finally heard from him. He's saying it was all Lori. She was the one. Anything she said, I was going to do it. It was her that was controlling me and and Alex. Interesting, to say the least. But how true was that, do you think, at some point? Did the dynamic shift at some point? And Chad really was willing to do pretty much anything she wanted considering his family's been knocked off now so is hers and he's got her so what else are you gonna do at that point he kind of i think got to his ultimate goal of he had Lori, but the context of it is everyone's crazy you think your kids are demons and they're dead Mm -hmm. it's it's a bizarre place to be where do you think that all how that all kind of came to be Yeah, I mean, I I was just as sort of surprised as anyone because this took three years for one of them to flip. I mean, I thought even before I published my book over a year ago that that somebody was going to flip. But it seemed that they stuck together, that they were real true believers. I think what's interesting about Chad saying it was all Lori was that particularly in that ecosystem that I've been talking to you about at the fringes of the LDS faith, that is a very conservative, very patriarchal part of the LDS faith. It's very male dominated. And and so I actually kind of find it a little funny that he's like, oh, well, I was taking, I was taking the direction from a lady. It it just doesn't really hold up for me. I also don't know that it's really provable in court from everything that we saw in, in Lori's trial. You know, there's these text messages over time about You know, there's one about Charles Vallow, Lori's husband, that was shot by her brother and in conversations about trying to get his life insurance. Chad says something to the effect of, I wonder if it got changed before or after he had two bullets in his chest. You know, so it's kind of one of those things where you see the callousness there, that the, there was this sort of plan at play and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that's going to be proven, but I'm, I'm very curious if this is a tactic that was shocked by his defense attorney who yeah. sat through all of Lori's trial, or if this is really the only way that they think that they're going to get out of this because it looks so bad. It feels like it's the only way I, I would guess. I mean, the, just the fact that the admission was made that way of it's all Lori. I mean, it almost admitted guilt right there to the yeah. murder itself without, you know, actually crossing that line. I, I'm wondering if at this moment in time, they're just, trying to save his life and there really is not a big hope of any sort of defense just like there wasn't much of a defense when you know Lori was on trial yeah and that could be i mean you know at the end of the day we're talking about you know two children that were killed but also chad's wife of nearly 30 years yeah. so it, it it just feels a little like i don't know man like <laughs> That, Tammy Daybell stood by his side throughout all of his writings and his, you know, his, his, like you said before, his writings were not successful. He, he, they really, at one point they declared bankruptcy. So, yeah. you know, she really stood by him. So uh, it just feels interesting to me that he would say, well, Lori made me kill my wife, maybe. Yeah. I mean, uh, without a doubt, how did Chad justify and Lori justify all the chaotic behavior? The, you know, literally the orchestration of these deaths. Because if you're going down the road of, okay, they have extreme beliefs, they think the end of the world is near. I don't know where that equates to let's kill our former spouses and children. I would be thinking for most prepping type individuals, it's hold them close and do whatever you can to protect them. They kind of did the exact opposite, but did it bold faced saying, this is God, this is God's mission. This is what he wants us to do. 
how did they cross that bridge when they are yeah. acting in this uber religious belief system, but somehow justification and I mean, very maniacal, very well planned murders and executions were taking place around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a fantastic question. I think that, you know, during the trial, we saw evidence that they referred to the people who were killed as obstacles that they mm -hmm. needed to be gotten rid of. You know, for anyone, I guess, that's maybe coming to this case for the first time, Lori and Chad believed themselves to be the leaders of the 144,000 prophesied in the book of Revelation, that they would be the ones to sort of pick and choose who would be the chosen ones that, you know, would be saved by Jesus. And they also had this really strange, you know, matrix of deciding whether or not somebody was a dark or a light spirit. So over time, people would sort of descend into darkness and then they would they would rename them. Mm -hmm. You know, they would get, they would sort of kind of do these classic things to really villainize them and dehumanize them before killing them eventually. I mean, allegedly, this is what Chad is accused of. So so I think that. You know, it was interesting listening to the trial because the prosecutor said, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with religion. This is all about money and power and in a sexual affair. I think it was about more than that because it was about those things, but they chose to use this religious language to kind of create a world for themselves that they could justify this behavior. I mean, that's the best way that I can explain it yeah. was – that these were simply people that needed to be eliminated. But you'll also notice that in the case of Jay, of Tylee, of Charles Vallow, of the failed drive-by shooting of Brandon mm -hmm. Boudreaux, um, that these were all people with life insurance policies. So in a way, they were each a, a, a bit of a, a large um, coin purse mm -hmm. for them. And that is also, I think, what explains why Lori and Chad were so quiet for so long. They needed to keep these people alive in the eyes of the government so they could keep, you know, cashing their checks. Their um, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say life insurance checks. They were getting like social security and disability checks and things like that. Sick of the ads? We are too. Start listening with no commercials now and get access to all of our episodes in advance of everyone else. Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts or go to our podcast page and sign up now. True Crime Today Premium Plus. Sign up now.